Okay. Um, could you go to slide four? Yeah. On the patterns, Africa 2000, 2010. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. And by the way, I just wanted to say something. Um, I didn't put it in my presentation, but uh, what Jody mentioned about domestic markets is so important, uh, I think, for Africa that imports so much food where agro-processing could play a role um, <clears throat> serving domestic markets. Okay, so um, patterns for Africa. This just shows, again, the trends for 2000 to 2010, and um, it's consistent with what um, Ludo mentioned about the uh, expansion of manufacturing in Africa. Um, along the horizontal axis, we have changes in employment shares. Um, along the vertical axis, we have uh, productivity in that sector relative to um, productivity in other sectors, uh, average productivity. So yes, in manufacturing, productivity is above average, but it looks, it looks a bit low there, and I think that's because it also includes the informal sector. So why has there been this um, reversal in Africa where all the things that are happening are also good for manufacturing? In 1990s, these countries were still going through a structural adjustment. There's been a huge um, boom in commodity prices. The quality, this is kind of amazing, actually. The quality of governance in Africa has improved tremendously from 1990 to 2010. And, and from 2000 to 2010, it, it, um, it was still, still getting better. So all of this bodes well for um, for more formal ma manufacturing um, happening in Africa. But um, one thing I want to highlight, um, it, I mean, there, there still is a big question about why is formal manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa lagging behind. Um, it might have increased, but it's still very, very, the share of formal manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa is still very, very, very low. So, um, and it's pointed out in the report, so agro-processing is a natural industry in which many uh, African countries could gain a toehold. But uh, I want to emphasize something that I think is extremely important that I didn't see in the report. And th that is that a key constraint on the expansion of agro-processing is uh, low productivity in agriculture. So there's a guy at the London School of Economics, John Sutton, who's done enterprise maps for Ghana, Kenya, Ethiopia, and a couple of other African countries. And he interviews um, some of the large formal, what he considers to be representative large formal firms by sector. And without, um, without exception, all of the firms in agro-processing say they're um, not operating at capacity because of a lack of raw materials. And so I think that's striking. And um, it brings it back to the importance of raising productivity in agriculture. Um, and that is, that is industrial, I mean, that has to be a, a part of industrial policy, I believe. So, and, and then uh, just two very specific examples. So Wajian Shoe Factory, which I'm sure Shaolan knows very well, is in Ethiopia. They're, they're manufacturing um, shoes for export to Europe and the United States. It's an amazing success story. At least last time I checked, it was an amazing success story. And um, but they, th that factory is importing 70% of the raw materials, um, leather. <clears throat> and uh, at the same time, Ethiopia has some of the highest quality leather in the world. So there's huge potential to increase the linkages uh, from manufacturing of shoes to um, owners of um, livestock through um, better upgrading of, you know, industry associations for the livestock sector, the kinds of things that the livestock sector has in China. And then also Blue Skies in Ghana, they're, they're buying, um, they're based in Ghana. They, they process fresh fruit and export cut fruit to supermarkets all over Europe. Again, the, uh, limited supplies have forced them to open up, you know, a, warehouses in other parts of when there are so when there are shortages of supplies so that's one thing and then the other thing I wanted to mention is the in manufacturing in sub-saharan Africa I apologize there's a there's an incoming call um, so I was looking at numbers from Kenya recently and I was just astounded this is this is showing um, from 1990 to 2007 the millions of employees in formal sector manufacturing and informal manu manufacturing sector in Kenya. 
And <clears throat> there's been a teeny tiny amount of growth in formal sector manufacturing, but the informal manufacturing sector in Kenya is growing like gangbusters. And I don't know, I, I don't know why this is happening, but it seems to me extremely important. There are jobs being created, but we, I think we all believe that um, formal sector, oh, sorry. I didn't tell you to change the slides. Are you changing them? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, yeah, we're going on. Are you on the um, Are you on the slide nine? Why is informal manufacturing? No. Yeah. yeah. I was talking. I was changing my own slides, but I forgot to tell you to change them. Okay. <laughs> so we're on the formal manufacturing there? slide. Yeah, we are still. We are there. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I apologize. So the, um, that is just shows this huge boom in informal manufacturing in Kenya. It, Kenya is one of the countries that happens to track employment in the formal and informal sectors. But so I guess um, the question I would like the folks that you needed to think about is what is it that's driving this boom in informal manufacturing, and what is the role of informal? Next slide, please. And what is the role of informal manufacturing? So in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Latin America, the informal manufacturing sector has expanded extremely rapidly. So why is it happening? How should we view this? And the conventional wisdom seems to be that informal firms stay small and that workers are better off working in formal firms, maybe. But there are also some anecdotes about entrepreneurs who start small and make it big. So there's a guy, Paul Kinutia, um, he, he founded a company called Interconsumer Products in Kenya. He was recently written up in Forbes magazine because, I mean, he started with $40 in, um, in a small shack in, in Nairobi uh, selling hair products to, you know, going around door to door selling hair products to hair salons. And he grew his company to be worth millions of dollars. And he, he was uh, selling now the company to L'Oreal. Um, so how, how likely is this kind of thing to happen, and are there things that can be done to facil facilitate this kind of transformation or structural change within manufacturing? So lastly, um, I, started, I started out saying this, and I'll just reiterate it. Can UNIDO play a role in helping us to understand the role of informal manufacturing? Obviously, you've, you've made the point in your report that it's a very, very important, but what can be done about uh, helping us to understand that? Thank you very much.